there aren't clear definitions. There isn't actually that much TI going on mm. in terms of how typology is treated at the moment. We're also in a sort of an age where sort of having disagreements over things is sort of discouraged. People are sort of encouraged or sort of to nod and agree with whatever they're presented with. And there isn't much of an attempt at the moment to really say, hang on, that doesn't make sense for me. And if that doesn't make sense for me at that type, how can that make sense for that type? Is the understanding of a type wrong? Or maybe actually all types can be completely different and we happen to have the same letters. But then that person over there who's also like me, they're actually not the same type as me. and not actually questioning that and having a conversation about it with everyone else to try and figure out how this all fits together. There isn't that sort of critical eye at the moment. It's called a sort of put on the down low. And as, as I said, a lot of nodding on different videos. One of the things I've been thinking about is this idea of a Jungian type. There are these two different main approaches, Myers-Briggs and Socionics. Is it the case that they're both independently legitimate? Or is it that there's a question of one being right, one being wrong? Maybe they're both wrong. Maybe there's a better theory that actually is better at measuring Jungian type. And the clear measure here being that it needs to be one Jungian typology end of the day. And, and the proposition would be to move into an age where we have one Jungian typology system. And my current opinion, and this is an opinion, it's subject to debate, of course, would be that mm. if given the choice between Myers-Briggs type indicator and socionics, I think socionics would be the better system and probably be the remaining Jungian typology. So this is kind of where I'm in. I'm in the position now where I'm starting to think, right, I'm going to put my finger out. And mm. I put my finger out by saying something controversial, which is that I think we should start just switching to socionics. And the only thing that's going to prevent us from switching to socionics is that not enough people know about it. Because mm. I, am, I am confident enough at this point where I could have a discussion with any person who knows Myers-Briggs, and I'd be able to convey the better merits of socionics to them in the discussion. I and from my experience, I cannot see an advantage to Myers-Briggs except from what I said before, which is accessibility. Mm. Okay. All right. What's up, everyone? So I'm Hi, everyone. Jack from World Socionics. And if you don't know him, then this is actually going to be a really great video because he's a big name, <laughs> at least from what I've seen in the socionics community. He has been for a long time. Um, I think it's also really cool to see you on video, too, because yeah. I assume that a lot of people probably get your tone <laughs> mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes yeah when it's when it text I, I find that I, I i think i'm quite a gentle guy in person mm. but i think when i express my thoughts in okay. writing i turn into i don't know vladimir putin or something <laughs> i don't find that hard to believe <laughs> Or at least you can, yeah, you could look like it, if anything. But yeah, I think that from seeing you and your mannerisms already, mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, obviously it's this way. And this isn't the first time that we've talked to. So yeah. for those of you who don't know, um, Jack and I, so Jack is pretty much the guy who got me interested in socionics because two, maybe even three years ago at this point, mm -hmm. um, I was under the impression, which many people probably still are, that Myers-Briggs and socionics are translatable. So that being said, an ENFJ, such as myself in the Myers-Briggs, would also be an EIE in mm -hmm. socionics. Um, and that was very problematic for me at the time, at the time mm -hmm. because um, there were other ENFJs or who, people who identified themselves as ENFJs who were identifying with EIE. And I was actively trying to fit myself into that box. And I was like, well, you know, maybe it's because I'm a nine. That's why this, maybe because this is that. And eventually it just, it just wasn't fitting. And then when we came across the whole idea, like, oh, you could actually be something else in socionics because the functions are different or like a little bit different in the way they're presented. Then that was very much news to me. 
So I started exploring. Um, I think when me and Jack spoke, then we were thinking ESE instead of EIE. So ESE for Socionics would be ESFJ, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, okay, sure. Granted, the ESFJ in Socionics is not the same as the ESFJ in Myers-Briggs. I remember that gave the example of like, oh, you know, we're thinking of someone like Josh Peck from Drake and Josh, you know, and then um, Jack's like, oh yeah, no, ESEs and Socionics are actually kind of like more forward in this way and this, I was like, yeah. oh, well, that's new. So um, Socionics definitely like is not translatable in that sense. Like, you know, and then pretty much long story short, I ended up finding out that I'm actually an IEE in Socionics. Mm -hmm. Um, when I read that description, that was <laughs> that was crazy. I made a whole thread about it on Twitter. I'm going to put the link to that in the description if you guys want to check that out. But yeah, it was wild because pretty much an IEE in Socionics is an ENFP, which mm -hmm. again is not the same as an ENFP in Myers-Briggs, but ENFPs in Myers-Briggs can also be IEEs but there also can be EIEs and they can be other things. So all of that to say that you can be the same type in Myers-Briggs and then translate that to socionics. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times also there are a lot of people who are one type in Myers-Briggs and then another type in socionics. And like my wife, for example, who is an ISFP in Myers-Briggs mm -hmm. in socionics, she is a SEI. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I would even go so far as to say most people who get ISFP would actually be SEI and Socionics. Yeah, I would actually agree with that, yeah. And and the way I kind of get the viewpoint of, okay, how do I get a sense of what that type is most sort of classically understood as? I go to say BAPT, uh, British Association for Psychological Type, a bit like the, associate, the APTI uh, conference, which was quite recent. And I meet people there who are like practitioners who type themselves as ISFP. And mm. I speak to one, and yeah, yeah, that's definitely an SEI right there. So that is what people think is an ISFP. That's an SEI. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so I've actually really enjoyed knowing these differences because yeah. now it's like, okay, are we talking about? ISFP, or are we talking about SEI? Are we talking about ENFJ, or are we talking about EIE? And sometimes, once again, you're talking about both. There are ENFJs who are also EIEs, but then you have people like Joel Mark Witt um, from Personality Hacker, who's an ENFP in the Myers-Briggs system, but most likely an EIE, ENFJ, mm -hmm. in the socionic system. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. Whereas like, I'm the flip, ENFJ in the Myers-Briggs system, IEE -E in socionics, and I'm still adjusting to the shorthand. Yeah. But anyway, so the reason why me and Jack are here today oh, is because yeah. there's been kind of like a small series of things that occurred. I know that Jack has commented on my recent video um, mm. on my development of introverted thinking part two. Um, and he left a comment saying that, oh, well, you know, like I, to I told a story on there that I'm not going to rehash right now. You guys can go and check it out. But he to I told a story on there. Um, about me and an ESFP um, mm -hmm. friend of mine, Myers Briggs ESFP um, friend of mine, that you know, we had some sort of like altercation and she was just trying to get a rise out of me. And yeah. I was like, keeping calm, whatever. And uh, Jack actually commented saying that most ENFJs, which I'm assuming you meant EIEs, would actually be more of the type to be like the ESFP. And I was like, that's interesting because again, you use the terminology ENFJ. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's not <laughs> accurate from what I've seen. Not that an ENFJ can't be that way at all, but I wouldn't say it's a pattern. Like it's actually very unlikely um, and all of that. And then I think on another video, Jack had also commented that ENFJs, um, they like, I think you commented on my sausage party video and you're talking about Emrys, the ENFJ and how him being like a little bit more Zen and all of that, like if anything, it's, uh, it's a, big thing for ENFJ types to be restless and something of that nature. And I was like, mm, mm. that is also not <laughs> yeah. accurate from a Myers-Briggs standpoint, but from knowing you, it's like, oh, I think he means EIE, which in that case, I can definitely see that with all the EIEs that I know. So then, yeah, me and Jack started talking about that. And then the last staple on that was uh, Jack had messaged me on Twitter 
and I'm probably showing a little bit of that conversation right now on the screen if you guys are watching. But um, essentially, Jack was um, presenting this idea that I guess now is a great time to swing it over to you. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in to see me and Denzel. Um, yeah, I am. Basically, I started off with Myers-Briggs back when I was 15. I was shown a Myers-Briggs pencil paper test. I took that, I got ENTP. I was utterly obsessed by the Myers-Briggs type indicator for several years. But once I was online, I discovered this other theory called Socionics. They're talking about on this online forum, personality nation. I got into that. And eventually I made sort of a transition in my thinking from Myers-Briggs to Socionics. And I've been doing Socionics now for, well, a, a good 10 years. And some of that I've been doing that professionally in terms of typing people using socionics. Now I'm a, a business psychologist where mostly my role is around doing rather long interviews for people going for senior positions at a large international bank, basically doing personality analysis for them, also a bit of test design, team development stuff, that sort of idea. And you use quite a bit of type as well in that. But the, the, the sort of the, the thing which triggered our discussion is how I've been thinking about how these different typology systems relate to one another. And they're kind of three different philosophies. That, well, there sort of were two philosophies, mainly. Mm -hmm. One of them was, oh, MBTI and socionics are the same, right? And we discussed that before. It doesn't really work, you know, right. they're not the same. You, you take the, you'll take the legitimate Myers-Briggs type indicator. That is like the most official marker of anything in Myers-Briggs, because that is what it's about, the test. The Myers-Briggs company owns the test. And you take that, you can get ENFJ, fine. But then you have to go through a socionics approach, which doesn't have a set test. It has different socionists usually. Um, or you read up that theory yourself and you see, right, that I'm the best fit in that profile. And that might be completely different, i.e. in your case. Now, so it may, people may draw from that that, okay, these are two separate systems. And as you explained very articulately, you could be one type in one system, you can be one type in another system. There's no enforced one-to-one -one translation between the two. Correct. I've never found that quite satisfactory. Mm. And the reason I don't find that quite satisfactory is at the end of the day, these are different attempts. Myers-Briggs, Socionics, um, I say some of the other viewpoints, like say Podlayer going further back or a cognitive um typology i don't think objective personality that one sort of separate entirely it just looks like it's uh, it's a uh, union but essentially they're all attempts to describe jungian type mm -hmm. the word carl jung first came up with right uh, some of these different movements like the, what we think of as myers-briggs itself is composed of actually a number of different theories all sort of cobbled together you because some of it's actually kiersey some of it is cognitive function based some of it is the four dichotomy based which is just the test some of it is the big five like 16 personalities <laughs> yes as well the lat is also thrown in there and it's mixed together and there aren't clear definitions there isn't actually that much ti going on Mm. in terms of how typology is treated at the moment. Mm. And I feel we're also in a sort of an age where sort of having disagreements over things is sort of discouraged. People are sort of encouraged or sort of to nod and agree with whatever they're presented with. And there isn't much of an attempt at the moment to really say, hang on, that doesn't make sense for me. And if that doesn't make sense for me of that type, how can that make sense for that type? Is the understanding of a type wrong or maybe actually all types can be completely different and we happen to have the same letters, but then that person over there who's also like me, they're actually not the same type as me and not actually questioning that and having a conversation about it with everyone else to try and figure out how this all fits together. There isn't that sort of critical eye at the moment. It's called a sort of put on the down low. And as, as I said, a lot of nodding on different videos. Mm. Now, one of the things I've been thinking about is this idea of a Jungian type. There are these two different main approaches myers-briggs and socionics is it the case that they're both independently legitimate or is it that there's a question of one being right one being wrong maybe they're both wrong maybe there's a better theory that actually is better at measuring Jungian type and the clear measure here being that it needs to be one Jungian typology end of the day mm. and 
trying to find out what that is, how it makes sense, how does it describe this phenomenon we all are seeing, but we're all trying to come up with different models and attempts to describe. Um, mm. And, and so the proposition would be to move into an age where we have one Jungian typology system. And my current opinion, and this is an opinion, it's subject to debate, of course, would be that mm. if given the choice between Myers-Briggs type indicator and socionics, I think socionics would be the better system and probably be the remaining Jungian typology. Now, there is also a question there in terms of, okay, are there advantages which Myers-Briggs brings, which socionics does not? If that's the case, maybe we could have a some sort of mixture of the two, but it's still logically coherent. It still has principles written from the baseline that still make it consistent. The reason I don't think that is because, because I started with Myers-Briggs and I moved into socionics and I've had several years grappling with both theories. I've yet to see an advantage of the former over the latter, except for accessibility. Does that, is that, does that make sense, Denzel? Everything up until the last sentence, I was, uh, I actually ah. wanted to really expand a little bit more on that, like um, accessibility. Right. Yes, because Myers-Briggs, it's from, in most cases, unless you're looking at BB, it's a four function model. Mm -hmm. No, it is a four function model and copy functions. Also, mo in, in terms of how the practitioners look at it, it's mostly about the letters, the four dichotomies, rather yeah. than even the functions. Um, mm -hmm. And in that way, for someone grasping it, I think, right, all I need to know if I'm an ENTP is what an E is, an N is, a T is, and a P is. And there, there we go. And sometimes they may want to look a bit deeper, go into cognitive functions, and these have been often distilled down to single action words sometimes, like, mm. oh, idea generation, oh, um, mm. creating harmony, rather mm. than something necessarily more complicated and nuanced, for you could go into an account that is more complicated nuanced, say, um let's say um lenore thompson bent as, as as an example of where that is a more sort of in-depth exploration of cognitive functions but either way it is a more simple to understand theory socionics is in comparison incredibly complicated in terms right. of that, <laughs> <Definitely much so. laughs> and it's more complicated than people think it is we all know it's more complicated they don't know just how complicated it is Okay, right. for instance, I'm doing a course at the moment. It's mm -hmm. going to take 16 weeks. Each of those weeks is a two hour long lecture. So <laughs> it's long. There's a lot there because what you've got is you've got, first of all, seven dichotomies, right? It's already more than just the four Myers Briggs, just to tell you what the equivalent of a cognitive function is. Right. right. Another seven to describe what the dominant slot is. What we call the leading function is. So also we call them different things. The slots are different to the cognitive functions. And we call mm -hmm. the slots the functions and the cognitive functions elements. And then you've got types. And the types have another 15 dichotomies <laughs> to look at. And a good number of them we don't even know the real meanings about. Or some mm -hmm. people think they do, and then it doesn't actually make any sense. So not only is it an incredibly complicated theory, it's also a theory people are still trying to figure out. Um, I've been putting a lot of thought into figuring out most elements of it. And I think I'm nearly finished in terms of the rain and dichotomies, but still subject to debate and discussion. Mm. It is very complicated. At the same time, it unlocks a huge amount more explanatory power. And what I mean by explanatory power, I mean the ability to describe more of a person's personality in complexity, nuance and depth. Mm -hmm. And to then put together a clear case for why different types are likely to get on with other types. Mm -hmm. At the moment, that's a very sort of fuzzy area of uh, a fuzzy territory. Um, mm -hmm. Most people, I think, start off with, um, with, with Kiersey's understanding of the NTs are probably good and the SFs, so, so, so the SJs probably shouldn't be too much of the NTs and that kind of thinking, which is very much the opposite of what social science puts, ahead, puts forward. I'd also say that the theory around intertype relations in socionics is actually to some degree, a limited extent, but to some degree backed up by research, empirical research. Hmm. 
what I mean by that is specifically it's research into teams. It's not re research into one to one relationships, it's research into teams, which limitation is that you have to assume that's similar enough. I, th I think for the, give, beggars can't be choosers. That is, should be treated as similar enough. And in teams, what they found was that what makes teams work very well together is strengths diversity. However, they also found that not all diversity is good for teams. Value mm -hmm. diversity is actually seen as potentially a hindrance to that team working well. So one could extrapolate from that, that high, high strengths diversity is good and low values diversity is also good. Now, this is something which Socionics grapples with, which MBTI doesn't grapple with, the difference between strengths and values. In Myers-Briggs, we talk about preferences. You know, you pr your preference for extroversion over introversion, sensing the introversion. It's a very sort of vague word, preference. Mm. It's you, they use the analogy of what hand you prefer to use when you write as an right. example. Mm -hmm. But that preference is kind of already leaning towards a strength rather than actually a value. Right. So value, your other hand, more or less, is that literally when you try to write with your right hand, if you're right handed, that's going to be easier to do. Right, right. But preference keeps it vague in terms of whether it's a value or a strength. Mm -hmm. so it makes that very clear. You value certain functions, others you don't value, and you're strong at certain functions and you're weak at others. And you may be strong at something that you don't value. You may be weak at something that you do value. On that basis, if you look at this, this the scene as the sort of the idolized relationship is duality. This is the complementary opposite type. So that is a type which is as different from you as possible in terms of strengths but still is in that sort of family grouping we call quadra, which is where all the values are shared between these four types uh, in this quadra. Mm -hmm. um, and people started thinking about these sorts of ideas. I've seen other um, Jungian um, sorts of typologists um, um, talking about, say, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, which are the names of these quadras. Some of the ideas are so sometimes already bleeding into the sort of melting pot that is sort of like the MBTI Jungian um consciousness yeah uh, and i think that to some degree so songs is starting to almost organically take over anyway mm. it's, like a few years ago i wouldn't i wouldn't recall anyone call, saying anything about their blind spots that's true yeah blind spot is straight from socionics it's the vulnerable function mm. uh, and these sorts of ideas are coming in uh, conventional ideas such as being in the grip from the inferior function it's always been strangely contradictory and counterintuitive and people have sort of started to reach to the blind spot they actually found actually makes more sense for me than this one um so this is kind of where i'm in. i'm in the position now where i'm starting to think right i'm going to put my finger out and mm -hmm. put my finger out by saying something controversial which is that i think we should start just switching to socionics and the only thing that's going to prevent us from switching to socionics is that not enough people know about it. Because mm. I, am, I am confident enough at this point where I could have a discussion with any person who knows Myers-Briggs and I'd be able to convey the better merits of socionics to them in the discussion. I and from my experience, I cannot see an advantage to Myers-Briggs except from what I said before, which is accessibility. Mm. Okay. Because yeah, now that that all totally makes sense. And there are so many avenues already that we can go from with that. Um, I think the the first question you probably has already know you probably already know. I'm less of a debater, more of a question asker, <laughs> and so I just share my thoughts there. But I think that my question would then be, um, how would you say socionics is helpful? in the sense that like, because both Myers-Briggs and Socionics are trying to help you to understand yourself yes. in one way, but unless I haven't come across such things, I haven't seen Socionics have a form, uh, an approach in actually being able to help people to better themselves in personal development. I think there's a difference between self-understanding and you know, you can understand your four functions to your eight functions to how they all inter 
connect and all of that. But then I, I had a friend call it like, you know, pretty much you're just um, self masturbating in a way. Yeah. <laughs> just better understanding yeah. myself. I'm just understanding myself. It's like, oh, that's nice, but what are you doing with that? Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm sure there probably is a way, but yeah, that's my first question because with Myers Briggs so far, like I use it as a yeah. coach. And of course, I've seen Myers Briggs used in many ways that I'm like, mm, I don't really agree with that. Um, and even with the schools of thought that I most ascribe to, as a coach, I feel tested myself. I think as an ENFJ, especially like my biggest thing is, okay, I have this theory, my NI is picking up patterns and everything, fine. But now I want to take it, the F-E-S-E, -E, I want to, you know, bring it to as many people as I can and see, hey, does this line up? So then before you know it, I, you know, as, since I'm doing um, coaching full time right now, I will profile like five INFPs in one day and they will all be like very different. But yeah. I can see how they're all using F-I-N-E-S-I-T-E in, um, in like they're all using it, but just in different ways. And I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. That's what brings, that's what makes them all individuals. And I can present all five of them ways on how they can develop themselves with their um, personal struggles that they're already dealing with. They might not all have the same struggles, but somehow showing them like, okay, you are literally like not using your extroverted intuition in this way. And that's what's keeping you from now being able to tap into your extroverted thinking here and boom, 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 boom. And so yeah. in using the model with Myers-Briggs, even if it might not necessarily be like always the most accurate it's produced a lot of great results that I've seen, where it's like, if we get a very accurate model, you know, hypothetically for it to grant that with socionics, um, people can better understand themselves with all the eight functions and everything. Sure. But where do you go from there? So I guess that's, that's the first question. And the second thing that's kind of shorter that I just wanted to bring up the, even with the eight function model, I remember that was one of the first things that like what you said about accessibility, Myers-Briggs is definitely way more accessible because when I tried to learn about socionics, I remember there was only like your site and another site that I was pretty much aware of. And yeah. I tried to start reading and I was just like overwhelmed <laughs> because it's like, wow, like this is a lot of information. And it seemed like there was also contradictory information. And just like you said, like it's yeah. incredibly complex. Every time people brought up socionics to me over the past few years, especially as a TI inferior type, then I always already have like an uncertainty. Yeah. Like, okay. I think I know my stuff, but do I really know my stuff? I feel mm -hmm. like I do. No, but do I really? And it's like, oh, with Myers-Briggs, I finally got up to a point. It's like, yeah, no, I know my stuff. Yeah. I think. <laughs> but with Socionics, it's like, wow, that would be a whole other monster to tackle. That would probably take me though. If it took you 10 years, it'd probably take me like 20 to really be like, okay, now I think I know my stuff. And so I can only imagine how it would then feel for other people who, because if anything, it might seem like, okay, if we just put all of our stakes into socionics, again, with my first question, would it actually help them? And then secondly, even if we did do that, um, would they even want to take on that monster? Or would they just be like, you know what, I'm just going to quit typology altogether. I liked it when it was a lot more simple. Because um, even in Myers-Briggs itself, when they stick to just the dichotomies, then it makes me want to tear my locks out. Like, no. <laughs> like, oh, I'm, you know, I used to be an INFP, but now my J is growing. That, that doesn't work like that. So let me teach you the right way, you know? Yeah. So I can only imagine how much more this same problem is going to become even more convoluted in socionics, and especially if it's not actually helping people grow. Whereas, like, I've seen Myers-Briggs, that's where... And from what my experience has been, it seems to have an advantage there. So I would love to hear your take on that. Yeah. So first point I'll answer is about the potential for self-development and growth from the model. Now, the difficulty is, right, mm. people who've been working with this model, with socionics, they have actually been more introverted, logic, TI-oriented people. So the focus they had when they were putting together the model was try to break it down into all of its elements and build up this sort of system. So there was, wasn't much of a thinking in terms of, okay, 
how are we going to make this useful for personal growth and development? Mm-hmm. How are we going to turn this into a, a coach's set of tips for someone to actually work and apply in their life to improve? This is something I've been thinking about a lot more. And there's, there's, there's a difficult thing in social science. It is rather like the myers Briggses and Jungian typology anyway. It's another universe, it's another whole universe of different interpretations and schools trying different approaches most of them oriented towards just trying to type people but Mm. having different methodologies for typing people not actually agreeing on how they're typing people which is not selling it very well you might say Um, what i've been trying to do with the world socioeconomic society is essentially taking a ground up bottom-up approach to really nailing down the definitions, making sure it all makes sense, having a good methodology in place for typing people reliably, using the same sort of techniques that psychologists use to to, uh, to, uh, do analysis, thematic analysis based on interviews. But also, as a coach, I'm someone who has also started my journey in coaching people. I've started using and applying socionics to help people in a coaching environment. So how do I do that? I first of all, look at how social science can be used to help people. And there is a huge amount of potential to use it to help people. And it comes from understanding how these different functions interplay with one another. Some of the work I've been doing is trying to describe that. How does each function link to each other function? What are, first of all, the interactions between functions, but also the transitions between functions from one to another as a person goes through different shifts in their life? both positive shifts and negative shifts. So this is something I've been actually unveiling in my course. A lot of these new ideas of mine that I've been thinking about trying to turn this into something useful because I can see all its potential. So I would say if there's one transition that I think is the most important for understanding feasible, sustainable growth for a person, that's going to be the transition from what we call the demonstrative function to the mobilizing function. Now, what is the the mobilizing function is more recognizable or mappable. That's going to be kind of like your tertiary function, mm-hmm. right? If you are that type, if you're if, if, assuming, if you were to, for, the, for, for suspension, of dis, of suspension of disbelief here, say you're an ENFP, that would be TE, right. the mobilizing function. Mm-hmm. Growing into TE. Now, what Myers-Briggs would say is, oh, well, you've got to go through NE and FI, and then you get to TE. Now, I say, actually, this is not how it works. In socionics, the idea is that these are transitions between two opposing functions. And you don't, you, do, you don't grow out, when you've got NE and you've got FI, you don't actually grow out of these to get to TE. This Dom Turt loop idea, I think, doesn't make any sense. You don't develop your tertiary at the expense of your creative. Mm. I don't think that works. No, these are, this is meant to be a positive growth. It's meant to be actually building up to something, not suddenly switching away from something which was positive. Right, so, right. So instead, what are you growing out of? It's not FI you're growing out of. You're growing out of FE. Mm. And this is the thing. Sociolink sets up FE and TE as true opposites, not, not um, FI and TE. Mm. FI is actually complementary. So what does that mean? Well, when it comes to an ENFP, what we tend to see is when they start off, they're more inclined to be focused on people pleasing. And they're more inclined to be thinking, how are people feeling around me? How can I gauge the mood of people around me to know that I'm doing well, that I'm actually you know, I'm not upsetting people? That becomes a focus for them when they're younger, when they're starting out. And they think, actually, I can do this very well. I can easily please, but I tend to be very likable. There aren't many unlikable ENFPs. In the same way, ENFJs actually usually tend to be quite likable, unless, of course, they've, in a way, I actually say ENFPs are more likable than ENFJs, because ENFPs are kind of, they don't take a strong stance of what mood they want to set. It's just quite pragmatically used to keep everything sort of likable and nice around them. Mm. But here's the point. ENFPs see that as low stakes, low reward. People pleasing is not the point for an ENFP. That's not the thing they do for the sake of doing it. It's mm. just something they might as well manage, and they do it very well and very easily. They don't have to expend much energy doing it. In fact, it's quite relaxing just to be chilling out around people and keeping the vibe quite nice and positive. That's not what they want to do. That's not their high stakes, high reward. 
And that's the thing, the movement from low stakes, low reward to high stakes, high reward is growth. The thing you take for granted versus the thing you're actually really pushing and challenging yourself and aiming at to succeed. And always there's a chance of failure in any kind of growth. There's always a chance you can, you'll crash and burn. But the point is, there's no point, it, it, you won't win. There's no chance of winning unless you try and take that risk in growth. So that is the nature of the mobilizing function. This is the high stakes, high reward. You could crash and burn, but maybe you don't. Maybe you have enough experience and you try it enough, or maybe you crash and burn enough times, you learn from that, and actually you get good at it. And this for the ENFP is going to be TE. This is going to be the acquisition of factual information, of knowledge that can be applied in a practical, useful, helpful way. And this is what ENFPs value. This is why so many ENFPs become coaches rather than say you know cult leaders as um, we were talking as you and uh, joyce and some other nfjs were talking about right um, right it, it, the point is you want to be someone who unlocks the potential of others not someone who is the the the, the cult of personality it's not about you influencing others it's about you simply by being there catalyze others to undergo self change and growth and development. And maybe you could learn something and grow and develop yourself as a result. Right. The yeah. Is looking for ways in which they can become more competent, more capable. They don't want people doing things for them. They want to learn how to do things themselves, to become a self sufficient organism, to, mm -hmm. and learning those practical skills, they can finally start to manifest their goodwill, their good intentions, and their potential as a human being. Mm. So this is the thing. ENFPs, actually, the more they grow, the more they could become a bit more practical, even a bit more task-focused, even perhaps a bit blunt when they've, when they've really grown into that area. They mm. stop. I've, see, I've spoken to old ENFPs. They become far less emotive. They become very matter-of-fact in how they communicate. Because they've moved so far into TE, they realize, I don't need FE anymore. It's actually not so important to me. They'll use it if they need to, but only really when they need to anymore because they've grown so much into their TE. Um, so that is the area of growth. And in no way is their FI compromised in that growth into TE. They've got a good balance of both in the middle. Uh, the thing which they struggle to really do is SI right at the bottom. Now... Normally, we talk about Myers Briggs. We say, okay, when you're about 60, you start developing your inferior function, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be so confident as to say that sociologics explicitly disagrees with that. What I would say is that sociologics, because it places also an emphasis on how you can involve others in your growth and development, it makes room for the um, for the dual partner or someone who at least can where you can also outsource some of your weaker points to others to help you. And that's kind of an important thing. A lot of um, one coaching model I took quite recent, uh, like earlier this year, was called the Go Mad coaching technique. I think it's a very, very good coaching technique, something which I did a course to do. Um, my, um, actually, my, uh, my boss paid for me to go on it. I'm very grateful to him for the opportunity. But essentially... Go, one of the key parts of Go Mad is actually how can you involve others in actually making a difference in what you want to achieve. Mm. So really, sociologics has that built in. Yes, you should involve others. You shouldn't just do it all alone. You, you take on the challenges you know you can, with practice, with effort, start to conquer and master your mobilizing function. But in terms of the suggestive function, like the inferior function, that's going to be a far more difficult journey. You're never going to quite gain the same level of confidence in it that you can with effort in your mobilizing function. To some degree, it's important to not, um, not say, oh, you'll, you'll never amount to said thing, but to also accept to some degree one's limitations and know how to make things work given one's limitations. So if that thing is... It's not really feasible to grow and develop entirely by yourself in a limited number of years. It makes sense to go to people who are naturally masters in that thing and draw from their from the gifts they have to offer and vice versa. You can help them while they help you. That's the, the, the glory of teamwork. That's why teams, when they're aligned well, are better than individual players, but not when they're not aligned well, then actually it fails to actually add to the individual um, contribution. Um, so... 
is it has a, so it, within this it has a model for both self growth and also growth and development through collaboration with others. It also has in the form of both the role function and the blind spot or vulnerable function an explanation for the areas in which you may have felt like you ought to grow, but which was always quite painful, societal expectations and pressures on you. And you thought, oh, I thought I have to do this. And I've been told this is what I'm meant to be doing. But it doesn't actually feel right to the individual. And it can feel like the wrong path that they're on. So socionics enables us to distinguish between positive self-growth and negative um, forced from outside conformity. And by understanding that, to some degree, it doesn't mean you should entirely stop doing that, because to some degree, it's also a bit necessary in the world. We have to make bargains with the world around us. We have to negotiate to some degree. We have to use our role function sometimes. Fortunately, interacting with our duel actually reduces the amount of time we're meant to use our role function, because they sort of, they, they minimize its effect as a pressure on our life. But nevertheless, when you're outside of that relationship, you still have to deal with it. But at least you know you, you, you know, this. It, don't feel guilty that you don't like doing this. This is part of um, part of the way your type is wired. This is not meant to be pleasant, but sometimes you just have to do it. At least you understand it so you can then take on yourself willingly rather than see it as something which is making you feel guilty. You're not quite on board with it, yet it's always expected of you by, say, a parental figure or a teacher or, or a boss or whatever else. And mm -hmm. then there's the blind spot, which... Even when people think they do it, they actually don't. It, it's so insidiously um, hidden from the person. And that's where, oh, that's a blind spot. I didn't know about that. Well, that's worth having people around me can help cover for that and make sure I don't sort of walk into a lamppost uh, mm -hmm. in a particular area. Uh, and I don't want to have to focus on it too much because it's almost painful. And I'm not going to say painful. It's sort of so alien to me. I wouldn't want to even have to think about it. It's almost something disgusting about it, mm -hmm. but at least being covered and how to think about it too much. Now, of course, types will also vary in their attitudes towards this. It's hard to tell an IEE, um, oh, you, you don't, don't focus on growing into every single area because an IEE will, will want to focus on growing into every single area. Let's say, oh, why can't I develop my vulnerable function? I want to make a point, but actually say, I could possibly do it. Fair enough. At least, at least you know what the theory says. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying you shouldn't, just that that might be more painful for you. That might be less positive for you to do. Um, right. But yeah, that's what, so, it, it, so once one approaches socionics with the lens of looking for what can be used to help oneself, suddenly it yields nearly boundless potential for helping someone. It just has to be framed in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. Now, the other question you asked, if I recall, because it's been a bit of a while since you actually you asked that question. <laughs> yeah. was around, let me, let, do you want to reiterate to me just so that I... Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was, uh, uh, I think it had to do with accessibility. There we go. Yeah. Yes. But, the, that's the, the key flaw to socionics, I think. And say flaws are relative. Mm -hmm. So... MBTI has many strengths, but it has flaws relative to socionics. Mm -hmm. The flaw MBTI, socionics has relative to MBTI is that it doesn't have easy accessibility. It's incredibly hard to learn. What we have at the moment is not nearly as many people know socionics as do MBTI. Right. Um, most people who do have heard of socionics, right? Mm -hmm. A few of them, few of them really understand it. Yes, <laughs> definitely so. There are also a good number of people who claim to understand it who actually don't. Yes, very, very, very much so. Very arrogant about it. And people say I can come across as quite arrogant as well. But <laughs> I will say this. When I'm with people who also know socionics, I, see my, I find myself changing my mind a hell of a lot. Mm. It depends on who I'm with and whether they've at the passed the threshold of knowledge to be able to counter my arguments. And then right. I'm I am listening. I am learning. I want to know what they have to say because they have useful insights. It just is rare. And so I look arrogant. Um, Makes but, sense. So when it comes to social science, there's like a small percentage of people who have, well, first of all, time 
but also perhaps some of the critical reasoning skills to also make sense of it. And that's very difficult. That's not realistic that we're going to have a small percentage of the population who are, and the people who, who are, who are at that level, they're all very clever people. Like one guy is a, has a doctorate in mechanical engineering. So chemical engineering. Another one has a, a PhD in neuroscience um, from Baltimore. And it, yes, and now works for a big hedge fund. Very intelligent people, right? So that's not realistic. We need to turn this into popular common knowledge. We need to make this accessible to people. So one of the things which I've been working on doing recently is this course. It's still a long course. It still covers all the different bases because I can't bring myself to leave anything else. It's going to be long, but at least it's a series of videos with diagrams, with video clips. Most of it, like the second half is mostly video clips is why it takes long. It actually isn't just content overload. It's watching video clips, but it is going through every single bit and piece. So at the end, people understand the theory and all, and all of its different complexities fitting together and also know enough in terms of how to apply it and had some practice in actually typing people using it. So that's what I've been trying to do, make this into something which is accessible. And mm. once what I, I don't expect everyone to take that course even either. I expect enough people to take that course, people who are interested in typology to then spread the word along to dis to then start to pass down their knowledge organically across the rest of the community so that it just rapidly accelerates what i see is already a bleeding out of socionics into the community does that, that make sense? yeah yeah that all makes total sense and i was actually going to say i thank you for actually explaining that because Beforehand, yeah, I, I I don't think that I've run into people who are using socionics in a way that would actually help people in the way that you're stating. Um, and from even listening to you speak, I realized that we actually seem to be doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So from that, that brought up a few more thoughts because it was like, okay, it seems like now in that case, it seems a little bit I don't know, I don't know the word, but it's almost like a reversal because now, speaking of the accessibility and everything, it seems to be easier, if anything, to, well, both, there's going to be pros and cons on both sides. And that's what, that's what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to like find a way to like explain all of it. But since Myers-Briggs already has as much accessibility as it does, and people already like, you know, the same with like socionics where people think that they understand um, socionics and they actually don't. And then people who even already look at socionics, they already know they, they don't understand and they don't even want to try. Yeah. So that's already like, okay, you're losing people there. But then with the Myers-Briggs, it's kind of like the same thing as well, where it's like people think they understand whether it's dichotomy level or even like function level. Like yeah. and I kind of like with you, I'm always in a position to like be open to like learning I don't, I'm not, I don't view myself as someone who's closed minded. And so I do look at, you know, okay, OPS has this idea of the 16 personality, well, 500, however many personalities that they got now. Um, even CS Joseph, you know, whoever I like, you know, I'm watching all these other people's videos. I'm trying to really understand because humans are complex, they're intricate. And so we can't really box them, you know, in the way that, you know, they're off, they often fear being boxed, you know, however, there are patterns that we're able to understand in that sense. Um, and so to me, it seems like, okay, since Myers-Briggs is kind of already doing, from my understanding, everything that you just mentioned with socionics, and it, it almost makes me be like, well, then in that case, socionics is already a bigger monster. So it'd be harder to get everybody already on board mm. to already do something that Myers-Briggs seems to already be doing. We just need to clean up that system a little bit more. Granted, I don't really see the uh, idea of, <clears throat> I don't really see the the purpose in also nuking um, socionics either. Like me, for example, I would actually love to take your course. I would actually love to <clears throat> better understand socionics. I'd actually love to be able to see, especially like how both systems work. Because one of the uh, thoughts that I had was I know that socionics does use the eight function model 
Mm-hmm. And in Myers Briggs, um, I I mainly listen to Personality Hacker. That's where you know I did my um, certification training and all of that. But then um, it's not it's not like a quote unquote indoctrination, as some have joked in the past about either. Because yeah. I also watch a lot of different things, and if anything, being close to Joel and Antonia myself, like sometimes I present to them certain things, like hey, I I'm like out here on YouTube, I'm watching this video. I'm, what do you think about this? We have Q and A's, you know, every like once a month and we'll sit there with like sometimes 30 people, um, actually twice a month because it's gonna be like, it's like every final Thursday of the month at 2.30 and at 7.30, then, you know, everyone, including alumni, they're able to come together and it's like, all right, do you have any um, questions and topics to discuss? about, you know, Myers-Briggs, you know, from your profiling, um, from all of that, we come together. It's like, okay, this is what we think about ESTPs. Find an ESTP on the call or whatever, or people who have ESTP. Like, we, we, we find the SE in it. It's like, does this resonate with you? So I really like that type of calibration mm-hmm. because Personality Hacker, they also have live events where it's mm-hmm. like, okay, now they'll have like 80 people <laughs> Um, and everybody knows their type. They all understand personality typology in depth. Some of them are mistyped and they find out at the event, like, oh, I'm actually, this is actually my best fit type, you know, stuff of that nature. So now it's like, okay, we can ask 10 ENTPs, do you guys resonate with this thing that Kiersey said? Or do you guys resonate with this thing? That even like Young said, you know, whatever. And like, can we get to the bottom of this? Can we tweak this? So I really like that type of calibration that we do because then we're able to not only see more of the nuance and everything, but we're also able to um, continue to work to better our understanding of everything. So all that being said, I I was curious about BB's eight function model. So that's actually why I brought that up. Mm -hmm. Um, Personality hacker. uh, The reason why I brought up saying that, like, you know, I, I most listen to them and everything is because they have actually recently introduced um, BB's eight function model. And they've actually, Joel and Antonia, they've been studying under BB for months. I think maybe. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Like they've been being mentored by him and everything. And so now it's like they got firsthand mentoring notes and all of that that they were able to now, now they're able, now they're incorporating into their podcasts and all their teachings, which a lot of people mainly just, listen to snippets of their podcasts, they'll hear like, oh, you know, we nicknamed introverted sensing memory. And then all of a sudden they just have all of these qualms about personality hacker. And it's like, okay, guys, <laughs> if you listen to the full podcast and if you actually like take some of their programs, there's a lot more here. Like they're yeah. not dumb. They've read a lot of like the past things and everything. So not saying that you would still not find anything to disagree with them on, but I think that they don't get enough credit and yeah. I'm not gonna, like pioneer them, but I, you know this is just where I'm coming from. So in that sense, the deep like them studying the BB like uh, BB's eight function model. My first question with all of that groundwork I just did is, from what you know, is it the same um, with socionics? Like I know that socionics they work with blocks. You know, like the the dominant and the auxiliary are like a block that comes together, and then you know things of that nature. Um, so if we were to put BB's eight function model and Socionic's eight function model next to each other, um, I would love to know, I don't really have enough knowledge on both to be able to compare and contrast as much. I know that BB's model is actually mainly going off of archetypes, um, but I'm, I'm wondering like how Socionic approaches it. So keep that one in mind. And then I was also just wanting to clarify two, um, two more things like real quickly. So. I would definitely agree with you that the whole age development thing that, you know, they say in person, like in not personality hacker and Myers Briggs. Yeah. I, I'm not with that. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think naturally mm. people might develop certain functions over certain ages, but yes. for me, I'm, I'm going to be 28 in December and yeah. I have met um, ENFJs who are much older than me. Um, and they tell me themselves, you know, like, wow, like the way that you present, the way that you are in tune with your certain functions and everything like that, like there is a development that they wish that they had earlier. And if they had learned about the type earlier, if they learned about, you know, personality development and everything like that 
earlier in time, then they would have been able to actually uh, um, get to that kind of level. So I, I, yeah, I don't agree that, like, I think that naturally certain people's like, you know, like if you just go through life normally, then yeah, your functions will develop naturally. But in knowing about type and doing active, you know, work on yourself and like understanding, like as soon as I found out that introverted thinking was my inferior function, I was like, oh no, <laughs> like I know that I'm always going to have a uncertainty there, but I'm not going to allow this to be as large of an Achilles heel as the average ENFJ out there. I know yeah. ENFJs who their introverted intuition, they view it as like, oh yeah, you know, it's a subconscious function. So it just works subconsciously. It just, it just happens. And it's like, yeah. oh, I remember when I used to use my NI like that. And I'm not saying that I'm better than them, but I remember that when I was using it at that level, which I would say is not even a low level, it's just with, you know, the best way I can say it is an average level. But when you are actively putting your mind in an NI simulation running process, that's an active process. That's no longer just, oh, NI is just happening to me. It's like, no, I have a little bit of control over when I'm putting myself into an NI standpoint when i'm planning when i'm running the simulations in my mind when i have accessed my subconscious the best that i could in several different situations and i constantly do that every day to yeah. not be able to read into cryptic meanings and stuff like that so there's a lot of things that you know it's like okay and i like because of my knowledge on um personality development and everything i have been able to tap into it in that way so yeah i agree with you like you know age development that's not the, that's not a thing but then lastly uh I, I also wanted to clarify the looping thing that you had mentioned so let's say for example um the example that you gave with like enfp um you had said that you don't really believe in looping because there's no way that you should develop your tertiary te as an enfp before like your FI and then it comes in contrast, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, did you wanna? Uh, yeah, it, it, it should, the idea that you develop your TE at the expense of your FI. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's the thing. So I think that a lot of people also probably assume that that's what looping is. The thing is looping is a bad thing. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a yeah. bad thing. It's, it's, it's a bad thing. Yeah, so if we're using ENFP, for example, uh, Myers Briggs ENFP. I know that when you were speaking earlier, you were putting it together, but just for people who are watching, it's like, yeah, Myers Briggs ENFP. So N E T E. I would think of someone like uh, the greatest showman. Um, if for those who've watched it, you know, you have Barnum, who is yep. an ENFP in my opinion. ENFP. Um, yeah. Extroverted intuition. Like, you know, he's loving just doing anything like different from the norm you know like he's just wanting to like you know he's attracting all of that but it gets to a point where him pretty much like he pretty much focuses on uh getting ahead and you know continuing to like make a better name for himself even at the expense of himself and the people around him that's where the fi was not really brought in and so it wasn't necessarily that he was developing TE to now become, you know, better. When you're looping, you're not developing TE. When you're looping, you're just accessing TE in a very immature manner. But when you get into your FI and you start developing your FI, like, okay, wait, instead of just trying to get ahead, instead of just trying to get money, instead of just trying to, you know, exploit people, let me get in tune with my values. Let me get in tune with who I am as a person. Let me get in tune with my motivations, um, how I feel, you know, what do I actually want? What things will I not step over so that um, even if money is placed in front of me, I'm going to hold core to myself and be like, sorry, no amount of money will be able to get past my integrity. If I do that, developing the FI, now my TE will not will not suffer because now when I do go after things, I have an anchor that's helping me to be able to, okay, I can still go after that. So now your TE is being developed, but it's not at the expense of FI. So the FI and the TE are actually working together with the NE. And then the more that you're doing that, 
that FI is also anchored to the SI, which is now like, okay, I'm still keeping a track of the things that are meaningful to me and what history has already like brought to me, the impressions that I've had. So now it's almost like an, a well-oiled machine where all four of the functions are working together. And it's almost to the point where it's like, all right, then in that case, I don't even need to go to the shadow functions, which I'm sure, and it, like, you know, you can go there and bring in a whole other four functions to explain what's going on. But most of the time, at least for my coaching, I've been able to explain everything just from that top four. <laughs> and so then that's another thing that's like, well, then why would I bring more intricacy with socionics? Yeah. Like, oh, okay, well, that's actually your seventh function. Oh, seventh function. Yeah, you know, and this is what's going on over here. When it's like, oh, no, you need to work on your auxiliary function of FI, which is then going to better your TE, even though you feel like it's going to slow you down, but you're going to have better quality with what you're actually going after. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think when it comes to P.T. Barnum and The Greatest Showman, it's a tricky one. I haven't necessarily tried to really type the character. Okay. Because I think he's actually a mishmash of two different types. Yeah, I heard that he's possibly uh, ESE in Socionics. He'd be yeah. considered like ESFJ. Well, well, but even that's not quite right. The problem is this. The real P.T. Barnum is an SCE. He right. was a very cynical man, very much about how he can get ahead, independently achieve. That mm. was the thing he was about. Extrovert sensation was a top thing. He wanted to, you know, um, make material gain. He wanted to act impactfully. He wanted to accumulate things, accumulate uh, not power over others, but independent achievement. And the other thing pushing was that mobilizing function extroverted logic supporting his extrovert sensation would have been introverted ethics he was a very good read of people mm. he's able to work out how what relationship he should have of each person to to work with them to get what he wanted mm. very very good at doing that and negotiating with people getting ahead but still very cynical and quite harsh judgment mm. and yeah very happy knowing if you know if people aren't in aren't um critical thinking they could be a sucker fine mm. He's, a, he's perfectly happy to be in that sort of environment and do that. When it comes to the, the, the musical version, you've got, first of all, it's a musical, and right. it's with kind of positive, friendly, more alpha values. Yeah. You have Hugh Jackman, who is an ESC playing him, who also makes him more sort of cuddly and positive. So he's a bizarre mix of both a sort of, you know, quite sort of wholesomeness of a musical, while also being quite cynical. And and then do paying its dues to the characters. It's kind of a weird contradictory mix. I wouldn't say extrovert intuition necessarily factors into that. Um, I say it's a mixture sort of extrovert ethics and extroverted sensation being shown at different times, different ways. But the main point is this: the main tension is that he's pursuing almost fame over the ties of loyalty he has with the people around him. Right, right. The, um, as it were, the the freaks, as it were, the people in in in, in his circus show. So the, the the problem is here that on one side that's like extroverted ethics. That would be a sort of the fame, my image, how I'm viewed by people, which would be FE and, and socionics. Yes, in so socionics FE, I should say, and he's what end up going towards that in the plot when really an ESFP would be actually prioritizing FI. Um, where TE becoming into concern would be about matters of, say, profit. How is this going ahead? How is this working? How is it actually um, working effectively and usefully? Now, what I say for ESFPs, these are not the types who throw their friends under the bus for profit. They've, they're still very much centered in their FI as well. I guess a difference is for an ESFP, and it's again, it wouldn't be described as a, as a loop, as like as a diminishing of FI. It's just that FI is just more flexible than their, than uh, both SE and TE for an ESFP, because the auxiliary function, our creative function, we call it, is by its very nature flexible. It's not rigid. It's not stubborn. Because mm. you look at say our version of an ISFP, mm. uh, um, and our version of let's say um, an INTJ. They're the ones who are quite uncompromising in their use of ethics of mm. dealing. 
where that take is first and foremost. Whereas for an for a, for an ESFP, SE comes first. FI serves SE, and mm-hmm. TE becomes another their growth area, their aspiration, the thing they want to push push forwards. So it's not about some sort of it's this idea of being some sort of negative loop where suddenly FI disappears. That's not really what it's about. Also, in the case of their character, he was doing more of an FE thing rather than the TE thing, because it started being about how he was appearing on stage and performing in front of the Queen and all that other stuff. Mm. It's, 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 I would, given how the character was put together, who he was actually based on, who was playing him, how he was being portrayed, I wouldn't expect to be a coherent character even to begin with. Okay. Um, whereas if I look at someone who isn't, there's a the thing, I don't, I tend to avoid live action adaptations of real people who existed. And I tend to avoid as live action adaptations of anything. If it's mm. put in that way, initially conceived that way, fine. Cause then it's usually as more coherent, not always. If mm. it's a comedy show, I definitely don't because then they just <laughs> character for whatever is funny, but if it originally existed in that form, then yes, I think there's something pure there to analyze. Mm-hmm. Um, or if I look at say, um, I don't know, um, characters I think are quite coherent, but often quite stereotypical, like Winnie the Pooh, very sort of one, quite one-dimensional, but you can see the idea of what he's meant to be. But combination characters are more difficult. The mm-hmm. other point we were talking about was about BB. Yes. Well, BB and uh, Model A, which is the mm-hmm. model Alsha Augustina Vizutia put together, they are very different, but they're both eight-function models. The... The, the, the approach is different, fundamentally. BB's approach was to say, right, I, there, are, there are eight cognitive functions, and I'm going to use Jungian archetypes to explain each cognitive function. Mm. Talk to Lenore Thompson, Vince, about this. She really doesn't like BB's model. She thinks mm. he's shoehorning um, the eight cognitive functions into a cherry-picked selection of Jungian archetypes. Because there are many more than just eight. He's almost, arbit- according to her, arbitrarily essentially picked those eight and sort of tried to squeeze cognitive functions into them. Sometimes mm. I find them very vaguely described and then applied. I've seen um, an example. Um, now, one of my um, one of the people I know is uh, who is very much a fan of BB is Richard Owen. Richard Owen, for instance. Um, one of his arguments for why, say, Russell Brand is an INFJ, in, 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 in his opinion, is because of this trickster function. And his trickster function, because he sort of puts in a rather sort of silly and mischievous air when talking about capitalism, because capitalism is TE, therefore it means that TE must be his trickster function. Now, I, I'm, I want to be very careful not to be, say, strawmanning BB by using... Right. Some- Owen's argument in that way, mm-hmm. but I, reading through what BB describes about, say, the critical parent, uh, the demon, the tricks, the function, all the rest, they are quite vaguely described, in my opinion. It's quite mm-hmm. ambiguous in terms of exactly what they mean and exactly how you distinguish one and the other. So, it's not, it's really done so, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, if it's intentionally done so, maybe it's because it makes it harder to criticize, perhaps. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> One of the reasons why there's so many damn dichotomies in uh, my, uh, Model A is because there's more ways in which you can then hold each function slot to account. Mm. It's not accurate unless it actually fits all these different dichotomies. And so there's seven function dichotomies, right? So the leading function, right, or mm. the top dominant function, has to be strong, has to be valued, it has to be stubborn, Right. It's not meant to be flexible. It sets the it sets the entire thing for everything else. It's not going to compromise. My way of the highway. It has to be consistently on, not just sort of switch off and on. It has to be. I, I can go on and go on and go on. There are seven different ways in which it has to be for it to be a leading function. And the creative function, the one next to it in the same block, is different in most in like in, in four of those um, seven dichotomies. So if, mm-hmm. if anything, the creative function is more different than the leading function than similar to it slightly. Mm-hmm. So that's this is how we put together everything and why everything's so clearly and rigorously defined. 
That's not to say when you speak to most socialists, they have done it to that level of sophistication because I'm one of the few people I know. I could have met someone maybe in Ukraine or Russia who has to do it. I haven't met them yet. Who's actually really seriously gone down and say, right, let's look at these function dichotomies and make sense of these functions according to all these dichotomies. I didn't come up with dichotomies. I've one or two cases. I have changed the definition and I'll be very open about that because mm. it just did not make sense. So mm. one example is when talking about conscious subconscious, yes. right? Yeah. It, it, it doesn't work when we talk about certain functions being unconscious. People can think about and talk about these areas. So it doesn't make sense. It's something unconscious. It doesn't make sense, at least in a socionics point of view, that mm -hmm. some blind spot is more conscious than your demonstrative function. That may, It doesn't add up to any... It, it falls apart as soon as you test that empirically. Mm -hmm. So I, I, had, I thought, what could this mean instead? And I came up with a different definition that the top two blocks are what are called public, more about our interactions with society, the outside real world, and the bottom two are more private, more about our personal aspirations and needs, or just the things we tend to keep to ourselves. Mm. And whether it's what we need or keep to ourselves, whether it's valued uh, and weak or strong and not valued. So we just, we could do this, but we're not interested in it. We keep it to ourselves. The other way up, the two public ones, one of them is strong and valued. So of course, this is me. Hello, everyone. This is what I'm all about. Strong and valued. Mm. And the superego, right? What is weak and not valued. What society is pushing quite nastily onto us and making us do against our will. Still public, but public in a very different way to the ego. Mm. Um, so that's how I've been trying to make sense of socionics. And this is the thing. Socionics in many ways also did not make sense. It has <laughs> to make sense it just needed someone with the with a with a brain and the time to use that brain for the sake of that task mm. and that's basically why i've been bat banging my head against this wall for the last few months trying to figure it all out and i've figured out most of it there's still parts of socioeconomics i don't understand mm. uh, there are people who claim to understand it all but usually when you test it, they, they, you quickly find that they actually don't or they come up with some other definition that doesn't fit with the other half of the theory. And so it's just a sort of cobbled together, inconsistent chimera of an understanding. Um, but yeah, um, does that answer your questions? That does, that does. That's actually, yeah, once again, that's very helpful um, because so I'm going into this still having like very limited knowledge of socionics and so this is helping me to, like I've already been open to see more of like its value. And regardless of anything that's being said, like I said, I still want to learn more about it. The place that I'm still skeptical is, okay, how, um, how effective or probable would it be to um, get everyone from here and move it and then move everyone over to socionics in that sense and then also figuring out like, okay, what would all the intentions and the purposes behind that be? Like, there's a lot of stuff, which I'm sure that you probably thought through, but you know, for me, it's like, well, what exactly, like, what, what is the probability of that even being done? Because people are always still gonna do whatever they're going to do. So um, mm -hmm. it's going to be like an almost impossible task to get everyone on board no. to just move over to socionics, which hopefully that's like not necessarily like your goal, but if it's like, oh, no, let's bring socionics more into the forefront. Mm -hmm. And like, it's like, oh, I don't see socionics as, um, personally, I don't see it as a system that is harmful for people to learn about. Is it daunting? Yeah. But if someone like you, who is actually taking the time to understand this, you have courses on it, and you're using it to help people, very stereotypical MBTI, ENFJ slash IE think oh if it's helping people <laughs> then i'm all for it because at the end of the day like that's pretty much like what it comes down to um but then i think in that same vein with the myers briggs since once again because of the accessibility thing um then it's still also helping people mm. and it seems to in my opinion still be helping people in the exact same ways as socionics would be just if anything in a more simple way because once again you can stick to those top four functions because even like when you were talking about you know the esfp tertiary with the te and everything like that uh when you had brought up the thing about um external ethics 
then that was the that was another interesting thing because uh socionics describes that as fe and there are you know like that's that's yeah. where you get a lot of the enfjs who are also eie because they're most focused on influencing and everything like that whereas like you know fi in socionics like for me as an iee my fe is less about influencing a whole crowd and being charismatic and it's more about these one-on-one -on -one intimate talks and stuff like that which socionics would describe as fi but then for me but then in um in myers briggs that would also still be considered fe just another facet of s mm -hmm. of fe so then when it comes to uh myers briggs uh barnum at least the uh the caricature that was in the musical to me i actually found him to be a very easy fit for ENFP, like he fit very, very cleanly yeah. with MBTI because it's like, oh no, I did not see any FE in him at all. Like even him trying to, you know, um, entertain the uh, the queen and everything like that in Myers Briggs, that's not necessarily FE, but it could be like a myriad of different things. I saw that as like FI still, so it's not even that his FI completely went away. If anything, he was self serving. And he needed to calibrate his FI because he was self-serving, like, oh, me, me, me. Yeah. And then the TE was like, yeah, me, me, me. So now let's use it. So the FI didn't disappear. He was yeah. still trying to get ahead using FI. Like, this is what I want. But he had to purify it a little bit more. Like, okay, wait, let me re-examine what my values are. This is what I want, but is it core to who I am and all of that? And then once he purified his FI, that's when the TE came in better. And then even with the dominant function, it's like the song itself is like a million dreams are keeping me awake. <laughs> and it's like, I don't think that at least Myers-Briggs ESFPs are talking like that. You know, if anything, like the NI very like, oh, one dream is keeping me awake kind of thing. But like NE DOMs are like known for the wide eyes and like I'm having so many different ideas and I'm, I'm drawn to the peculiar, yeah. you know. So when yes. we, yeah, so when we're seeing like, you know, oh. Oh, a bearded lady. Oh, that's interesting. That's uh, that's that's very different from the norm, which the yeah. SI is more of the norm. So an I, SI dominant would be like, oh, a bearded lady. I'm not used to that. But then you see Barnum, like, that's so interesting. I like that. I want to find more interesting things. And then, so that's the NE. Mm. And then I want to be able to exploit that. Mm, but I should probably do it in an ethical way, FI. And then, so now he's helping everyone to become a little bit more used to what's different and then before you know it now uh the ne becomes the new si a lot of people are now used to ambidextrous people and they're used to people flipping in this way and all of that and now barnum if he was probably here today at least i don't i don't know of the actual real life barnum but you know barnum yeah. by hugh jackman if he were like characterized today now he would probably be looking for something even more novel in you because he'd be bored like okay now it's been normalized what I brought to the circus like a long time ago. So I need to find more NE interesting things. And then the cycle continues. So all of that, once again, I didn't have to move to any of the shadow functions. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's like, oh, then we could literally just continue, just keep it simple with the Myers-Briggs. And that would probably continue to help more people to come there. But we do have the problem with a lot of people not understanding, just like with socionics, um, a lot of people not understanding like, oh, well, because other people would probably think that like, oh, well, that's F.E., you know, like he wants to show. And it's like, no, that's F.I. <laughs> like F.E. Yeah. can be that way. Yeah. But again, if you look more closely and everything, it could be explained because each function has different facets and they show up in different ways. And so, yes, in ESFP, I've, I've, I've known ESFPs who would do very similar things like not necessarily once again throwing away their fi altogether but they would throw other people under the bus in order to get ahead because yeah they're taking a, they're moving too quickly with the sete and they were like oops i forgot to consider if this is true to me and if like you know what the long-term implications of this would be which is the ni inferior so this is big so on, on the one hand i think this is the question i forgot to answer before mm -hmm. you can construct any model and no matter the level of resolution, mm -hmm. you use that model to describe the thing which you see. Yeah. You 
perhaps no, through that lens rather than another model, which may be the higher the resolution the model, the more tools you have at your disposal right. to actually sense of things and tie things together. You yeah. could unlock a more complicated explanation. You could explain more parts, perhaps. Yeah. You could uh, differentiate between different bits and pieces. The reason why I haven't really bothered or tried to make sense of, um, of that catch because I don't think it is actually a a realistic thing I'm being uh, that's being presented to me. Mm. So I wouldn't expect it to actually make sense. But if, if I were to really try hard, I could make sense of it. Okay, yeah, and I believe that. If I were to look at a real person, if I were to look at, say, the real P.T. Barnum, Mm -hmm. I can see the different um, parts going together. Now, one of the reasons this point you make about um, chasing SE too much and therefore X and TE too much and throwing FI, for FI throwing someone under the bus, it wouldn't quite work for in that for that in socionics because of the blocking point. And the way the blocking works is that it's like these in individual cognitive functions or information elements, they're highly reactive elements. If you take out lithium in, and expose it to the air, it will very quickly develop a rind. It will combine mm. with uh, molecules in the, with atoms in the air to form new molecules. Mm. In the same way, introverted or sort of extrovert sensation, when you take it out in, in real life, not just an abstract idea in your head, it must block with something. It must block with either TI or FI. Right. Uh, this yeah. is the thing. So science goes down to the metaphysical first the actual stuff around us is made out everything around us is made out of socionics or rather made out of information which can then be metabolized so extrovert sensation it has to exist in terms of structures or in terms of relationships um power or force or the extension of a physical object in space there's some sort of structure in this case you know, this physical extension is composed of matter blocked together by certain rules which, in, which involve these molecules binding together to form this physical thing. And there's certain rules and forces applied. There's a rule called the uh, photo, um, ele the electromagnetic force, which means that if I were to bang myself on the head, that would hurt. So <laughs> there are laws around the physical matter, the physical mm -hmm. extension. So in, that, in this case, it's SC plus TI. This actual model is SC plus TI. But in terms of a relationship between two people and one person being more in charge than the other in terms of that relationship and being more dominant in the relationship, that is force exerted across the bonds of one-to-one -one relationships, FI, in socionics. So that will also, it wouldn't make sense for an ESFP to engage in SC without FI also hitching a ride on the back. Mm. And so it, the way that an ESFP uses SE also implies FI. And the way that an ESTP uses SE implies TI, mm. and then they have the blind spot of the FI. Mm. Um, so when I think of a realistic, when I think of a more, a more realistic character, and still I don't think he's amazing. Some people don't think he's realistic. I think he is. I think it's Walter White. Mm. From Bad. From now, from Breaking Bad. I need to start that show. People keep. Oh, going. okay. It's very, <laughs> very good. But this, because this is a very nuanced approach to, um, to character analysis that went into the writing of him. The level mm -hmm. of sophistication on saying the characters is better than you know a, a fun, a, a fun musical which has yeah, yeah. a character played by someone of a different type and all the rest. It For is sure. a more realistic portrait of someone who develops over time. It's still slightly fantastical, simply mm -hmm. due to the level of change and how meek and shy he was and how strong and developed. But the whole point is character ana analysis was key to the design of a character, even if it sometimes bends, suspends disbelief a little bit. And mm -hmm. it is a very much a good model of an ENTJ. And mm -hmm. the growth of someone who... Even as an ENTJ, right? He does go astray, right? How does he go astray? Right, well, he becomes uh, tougher. He becomes a more assertive man. When before he was very sort of meek and very inclined to avoid confrontations or breaking the law and all the rest or murdering people, he, he goes down a moral decline as he becomes tougher. And it may, at the same time, at no point does his intellect get sacrificed. He's still smart he is still strategic 
he still dips between tactics and right. strategy as you'd expect of an ENTJ. But the mm. FI is what's lacking. He starts to lose track of his introverted ethics, his personal relationships, and actually he's letting down his family, not actually providing for them. And that is the, um, so as he grows in his SE, mm -hmm. his FI is still not actually being developed properly. Mm -hmm. And you don't see, you see his deficits start to show more and more clearly. So mm -hmm. that, that I can see working. I, I, I just haven't really seen an ESFP. What an ESFP is about someone who protects their close friendships. They mm -hmm. are a, they are the sort of person who, when they they know they it's a very strong, very fluid area of theirs they have in terms of being able to maintain their one to one relationships. Sure, they can break off a relationship if they want to, but that's mm -hmm. under their control. They don't lose track of 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 the one to one relationships. They should be able to balance the personal subjective with the practical uh, factual. I'm trying to think of what the other point we would... Do you, do you see what I mean? That it's the idea that you get weaker in a certain area by becoming stronger in a certain area. It doesn't quite make sense in socionics. And I haven't seen... And there's still a fictional example. I haven't seen a real example of someone who actually grows or rather deteriorates or loops in that kind of way. I just don't, I, I don't, I, I, sure, you can take the idea and you can look at a fictional character and you can make it make sense. Yeah, you can make a lot make sense. Of what well, yeah. You could take type A, type B and use that to explain perhaps quite a lot about, um, you know, um, the character as well. I mean, he'd be a type B rather than a type A. And mm -hmm. he's with type A's and he's being a type B. And so, you know, he's going into things, getting into trouble, not really thinking about it. And so people feel let down. And so he needs to um, reconnect with his type A's and uh, readdress the order and the structure in his life. And what is the order and structure in his life? What are the things which could fall apart if he goes out and he tests things and potentially breaks things? His relationships with the people around him. You, you could take almost any sort of model needs to explain the things around you. That isn't necessarily the test of whether it actually makes sense or not. Okay. The, the rule, I think, it should be something which is real or sophisticated enough to be a good um, alternative to real. You know, it, it, it at least represents real enough to work with. I don't think Hugh Jackman playing P.T. Barnum in that major showman is close enough to real because of the reasons which I described before. Um, does, does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Um, there's, there's another point which okay. sorry, about how yeah. do we get people on board. We're not going to get everyone on board. Mm, okay. Part, yeah. There are different reasons for that. Some people, and I'll, I'll deal with the, the most negative view first. Some people simply are not honest actors. Some people, it's not in their interest to pursue the true or better theory because for them, they've got, they're getting money from what they've done. They carved out their niche. They want to keep their followers. They will see it more in terms of a cult mentality, but it's not still not a cult because there isn't any real cult. There's no force or control keeping people in. It's not a true cult in any way, shape, or form. Right. But some people are not really honest actors. They don't act like honest actors. They don't have debates and discussions just in case their things could be challenged or criticized, which harms their profits. Right. That's, I'm not saying that's everyone. That's I'm dealing with the worst case scenario. Right. Some other people who you know, they're used to their model. It takes a certain hump for them to get over before they think, right, I should start taking this thing seriously. And that takes a certain amount of exposure to begin with. They need to sort of bump into people like me or other people talking about it who make enough sense to make them reconsider. Um, some people simply don't have the time and it's working quite well for them what they're doing. They're not um, maliciously thinking that, oh, I'm going to keep out this thing. It's not a willful ignorance. It's simply just a, an ignorance which happens to be quite blissful. Mm -hmm. um, then there are people who probably just, you know, may, may, maybe they, um, maybe the it's scary to also go through the sort of the flux and change that would involve having one's type questioned. Right. And that's more of an, of an emotional reaction. I don't think I'm, I feel psychologically strong enough to go through that. Right. I, one example of someone who I think is um, who, who, who presents themselves as an ENTP mm -hmm. would make sense as being more of at least in socionics, uh, the version of the ENTJ. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
is not willing to have any sort of interaction with me whatsoever, even be in the same room as me, even though an online room as me, almost out of fear of what I might say or do. It's just terrifying to them. Mm. The idea that someone could speak uh, could, could speak in disagreement on what their type can be and they won't have the arguments <laughs> to handle it. So they they will so that's not I wouldn't call that a malicious thing. I yeah, think yeah. he's being very, very defensive and doesn't have the strength and resilience to say, actually, I could be wrong, and that's okay, because mm. most people are wrong. Mm. And even I have been wrong so many times in my life. Even the great Jack Aaron, who thinks he knows absolutely everything in the world and thinks he's, you know, the big whatever, I get it wrong so much. Mm. I changed my mind the other day about Luciano Pavarotti. I did a mistyping of him, Major. I thought it was an ESC, is actually an SCI. Mm. You know, we, we, all make mistakes yeah. and i think there are people what i like to do to prevent myself making mistakes is i make friends with people i think have who look at things in a different way to me who actually can reach insights i can't reach mm. my friend is a good example of that i've got two 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 of my really good friends in this rita she has this penetrating insight where she gets a sense of someone's type before she can necessarily explain exactly how it fits but after a while after teasing out she's actually is right Another guy I know, Peter, his knowledge is humongous. He is a lot older than me. He's got mm. very, 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 very inc incredibly clever. He has got lots and lots of accumulated knowledge over his years of, of life as well. And so he has lots of things to offer and experience to offer. So every to be a good typologist, I would say, you have to get over the hump of be, finding out you are hopelessly wrong absolutely absolutely wrong you yeah. have to do that multiple times yeah you won't get better otherwise yeah exactly i was going to say like that's if anything that's how you were able to become as confident as you were i'm assuming um because just like you said you've been wrong so many times you've thought through so many things you've been challenged so many times then now it's like okay i've built more of an ability, not necessarily resistance, but it's like, oh, I have a confidence here to be able to share what I think because I, just like you said at the beginning of the um, discussion, you know, I'm putting this controversial opinion out there. If anything, to have people try to attack it, let's see how long. Let's see how long it's able to last out there. If it, you know, falls flat, then okay, we have to get him out the ring. We have to train him a little bit more. Or just, you know, go with whoever the new champion is, you know, but this is where we're going to like, you know, have to make sure that this is actually uh, something that we're open to. And I think that that's just like what you said, like, you know, you like to seek people who can reach insights that you aren't able to reach. Like, I feel like I'm actually very similar in that sense, because if anything, that's one of the reasons why I was like, hey, yeah, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to continue to learn here more because um even though i definitely have my own thoughts and even though which i'm glad that we're in agreement like oh yeah obviously we can't get everybody on board in that way um i still wanted to understand like your perspective your standpoint and i wanted to see where i was probably missing things um and i now understand like oh this is how socionics can be used to coach people and this is some of the things that i was misunderstanding in that way and also even some of like more of the differences like just even as you were talking about Breaking Bad, like I said, I haven't seen it. I want to see it so badly, but my very close friend, Joyce Meng, as you probably already know, she told me that she, she's been, she watched through the show. She loved the show. And as you were explaining, she never told me the type of the guy, but as yeah. you were explaining him, just I just loosely in my head was like, oh, this sounds like a stereotypical INTJ in the Myers-Briggs system. But then when you said ENTJ, I was like, interesting. And then I was like, well, you know, I haven't watched it yet. So it's like, let me oh. see. So I actually texted her. And I was like, okay, Walter and Breaking Bad, what type do you think he is? And she said, INTJ. And I'm like, okay, Jack is yeah. ENTJ. And so it's like, but I, I don't think it's a right versus wrong thing here personally. But I think that, oh, just like what you were saying, it ties back into the whole model thing. For me, in my model, it's like, oh, an ENTJ wouldn't have to like learn how to become that way. Because the TE dominant is already going to be that way. Yep. And so then what they really have to learn is the NI a little bit, which they're always still using. 
to but now it's going to come more in the sense but for uh walter again i don't know but from what i'm understanding it seemed like he had to learn to become a little bit more te at least in the stereotype mbti way um, yep. and that's what allowed him because he was a little bit more nifi and again you know just for people watching that doesn't mean that you're not tapped into te at all i'm sure there's still instances in where he was using te but when he developed the te more then that's when it became more apparent that like now everything was moving together so it just goes right back to what you were saying about how every model like you know can be it can have its own explanations and all of that um and so for that reason i am uh yeah i'm pretty much just really grateful uh that we were able to have that conversation because it, it helped me understand more like okay it, it's still showing me that okay in socionics this type can be this type and it can be explained in this way and you can use these functions in that way and it even goes back to like what you said with like bb which um i realized that jung kind of did the same thing and it's been said that jung he kept things pretty open because he wanted people to use this as a model in a way to like it, it leaves like room for creativity i suppose to be able to just be like hey um this is this is uh, using these archetypes like they're not supposed to be very static but it's supposed to be something that you kind of like use to just better under it's a model to better help you understand yourself like personality hacker they like to uh, say this thing where it's like a model a map is not the territory um, I think that's what they say. We pretty much they said that like, if you were to have a accurate map of New York City, then you would need to like the map would need to show you how, exactly how tall every building is and where every single rat is in every moment and where every single human being is and all of that. Yeah. And event essentially that type of map would be useless because it's just showing you everything you know, and that's it's way too detailed. What you want is the type of maps that we see where it's just like a little bit zoomed out you can get a rough idea and it still helps you navigate and so that's why i asked originally like okay well what exactly is socionics for like is it just for better understanding and be like okay i'm done or is it for personal development and you explain like how for you you've been using it for personal development so that i think that's great um but i think that where you're focused on is reality in that sense and I don't, I'm not opposed to that. And I don't, I don't think that personality hacker or, well, I can't speak for other, <laughs> I don't know other MBTI type of people like as closely, but um, I, I like, if anything I know for myself, I'm also focused on reality. Just like I talked about with my coaching, I like to check like, Hey, does this resonate with you as an INTJ? Would you be the, like, why or why not? I want to, I want to read the theory and then I want to see the SE evidence. Like, mm. is this in real life? You know? Um, yeah. And so from that, um, I'm seeing that like, I do see both as like reality, but they're just still explaining in a different way. The, the difficult part is you need to make sure that your starting point is, mm -hmm. is, is, is as foolproof as possible. So mm -hmm. I re I'm under the assumption that at, at least 40 percent if not more perhaps even up to 60 percent of people even more than that of people in the myers-briggs community are actually mistyped yeah <laughs> <laughs> if it were to reach out to this person who says they're an intj mm -hmm. and say what you what do you do resonate with that and they go right. oh yeah yeah sure they don't and there are other things also that can get in the way what well, that's I why i stick to like the live events it's like okay i know you guys know for sure but yeah, yes. you, you need to meet people well. But there's another thing, which is the way I would do it in socionics is to start with the definitions of the information elements. Hmm. So we reached a, a, a difference there in terms of Walter White. You say it sounds like an INTJ. Why? Because you say, well, if he's an ENTJ, he should already be quite forceful. Right. That's because a lot of the forcefulness has been put onto extroverted thinking. Right. Whereas I say, if, you if we were to interrogate, why would thinking be the place where forcefulness would be or assertiveness. Mm. You look at someone who is what's one of the most forceful sorts of fi figures in recent memory. You know, someone's very sort of, I'm the boss, I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We often think of someone like the previous American president as, as a very clear example. 
Or you could go to Brazil, look at Yair Bolsonaro as another example. It doesn't always have to be about Trump. These figures, normally we don't often say they're TE types, though. We say they're probably extrovert sensation types. Yes. We can see that forcefulness is actually something quite primal. It's something quite physical. It's mm -hmm. rising on that moment to be the one, hey, look at me, I'm the big guy. Yeah. It's not something which you, it's not a system you game. It's not something you have to collect empirical data and work out the methodology and how to do this most effectively. Mm -hmm. And Myers Briggs, well, not Myers Briggs, but cognitive functions have sort of combined the two together. Mm -hmm. The reason why it's been, they sort of mushed that forcefulness, which Jung never talked about in that sort of right. way, a strictly right. empirical, uh, a posteriori knowledge gathering sort of. Uh, function it wasn't about force. He saw it in terms of views of gaining factual knowledge, truth, as it were, attitudes, truth. The way it became like that, I think, was because of the interaction between a dichotomy based Myers Briggs and a cognitive function based Jungian cognitive functions, that sort of approach, JCF. What well, people well, I'll just say real quickly, I actually yeah. do think that it's mainly because of the SE tertiary. So if anything, um in ENTJ because of the SE like you're saying that TE with the SE tertiary would make them a little bit more so but then yes. because again they're a thinking type then the feeling would be inferior and so stereotypically not all ENTJs I actually made a video recently on ENFJ versus ENTJ and why ENTJs especially ENTJ women have been mistyping a lot of times is ENFJs and INFJ so it's not all the time but uh, with that thinking dominant, then it's like that could also make them a little bit more tactless. So then they yeah. can come off more forceful. But I do agree with you that it is more of like a SE thing, and thinking in itself does not mean forcefulness. So, yeah. but sorry, but they have, they're a very good example, right? The, the 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 perfect example of the female ENTJ who is not forceful. We think yeah. of Susan Storm, very good mm -hmm. example, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susan Storm. I interviewed her for Socionics a, a while back. Mm. I think I might be wrong. No one's, did, no, one's, um, no one's said, no, you're incorrect. I think I was the first one to pick out. She was a ENTJ Socionics. And because I went through, because I'm looking at it in terms of extroverted logic, not into, uh, and I, because I've got a very clear separation between extroverted sensation and extroverted logic. Mm -hmm. and, comes to an LIE in my head, I see a figure that's dynamic and growing. Mm -hmm. How do they grow? They actually grow from extroverted intuition, demonstrative function towards extroverted sensation. Mm -hmm. This is a type that becomes empowered over time. When they're not in that empowered state, they're actually very speculative, very open-minded, open to different perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan is open-minded, different perspectives. For sure. But there's also a, a side of her, her journey of growth would be to become more empowered, actually be a bit, become a bit more potentially bossy over mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. actually feel, yeah, I'm in charge. I can take charge of what I want. And of course, we discussed all the reasons for why she was very open and very candid. I'm very grateful to her for being candid about some is why maybe that side hadn't developed to the point where she is today. Mm -hmm. um, she's made it work for her certainly in her in her blog and being very open-minded about typology if you right. track a lot of other entjs they do become more sort of pushy look at say quentin tarantino that's mm. the kind of sc we see in the entj it's sort of it's not mastery it's right. sort of the flailing oh i want to you can't you can't make me do what you want to do you can't mm. push me around you i won't march to your tune it mm. sometimes looks a bit pathetic because it's not actually strong but it can look intense, and to some people, it can look like intimidation and then pushing their weight around. Mm -hmm. But it actually isn't a strong, consistent area. It's a mobilizing function. Over time, it yeah. can get to almost that level. And that's kind of what you see with Walter White. And he always had TE in the sociology mm -hmm. understanding. He was always very empirically, very, very factually knowledgeable. That's the main thing. He's factually knowledgeable, and he's strategic, and he thinks ahead. But he developed his SC and his FI is not really anywhere. He thinks he might have FI. He, he has a family man, but really it turns out he is, wasn't very reliably loyal. And as soon as he starts to realize he actually was not helping his relationships when he deludes himself thinking he was, that's his turnaround. And when finally he 
ex exonerates Pat by saving his friend mm -hmm. and dying in saving his friend and leaving his money for his family and all the rest. So eventually he does cover the FI, he realized he'd lost it. Um, we just hadn't really been thinking about it properly to begin with. Um, so, but you can see why another thing I'd say, ENTJs don't test as extroverts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they do, not so often. The least, yeah, down, right? yeah absolutely. Uh, and there's a reason reasons for that. First of all, because extroversion, I think, in not all questionnaires, but I think a lot of understands of extroversion is overly lumped in with socialising. Yeah, um, it's very really annoying. <laughs> and um, NTs are not naturally mm -hmm. social. Right. Out of NTs. The alpha NTs, right, the NTPs actually have values that lean towards being a bit more sociable. They want to feel included. Mm -hmm. But the gamma NTs, gammas, have values actually very layman introverted. Even ESFPs I talk to sometimes think or say, oh, I'm a bit introverted oh, at times. Happens a lot. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, and it's, you don't, I don't get that with ESFJs. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, more of an ESFP thing because they they feel like they value they have the values of an of a, of a of an INTJ essentially. Mm -hmm. and they appear almost like an ESFJ until you start to realise what's going on there. Right, uh, they are their strengths are extroverted. Their mm -hmm. values are introverted. Yeah, their focus I would put it as their focus being more on the external world, visceral experiences, if you will, things of that nature but not necessarily always having to do with interpersonal things. Um, and so that's where their extroversion would come in. Um, but then, you know, if you contrast that with an ISFP, then you still see even the difference there with their focus on the external world. And it's like, okay, this is how an introverted version of you would look like. Because then you also have to look at the introverted intuition, polarity, if it's an inferior position or a tertiary, at least with the minus breaks. So, but yes, yeah, yeah. I, I'm seeing a lot of how I'm, I'm seeing a lot of the correlations that we're making there. Um, I think that's really fascinating, if anything. There's another thing there in terms of an ISFP, because mm -hmm. their FE is no longer the demonstrative function, which is kind of free floating. It's kind of can be tapped into a lot. Right. For an ISFP, it becomes the ignoring function. Mm -hmm. And this is something that goes straight back to Jung. Jung described this the dominant function suppresses its inverse. Mm. So mm -hmm. someone keeps that mm -hmm. kind of forgets about it until BB talks calls it as being the oppositional. It is right. the ignoring function. It is only released when it suits the leading function to come out. Otherwise, it might as well not be there. So yeah, I that is what BB said. You're right, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you look at um, BB said, okay, good. So um, <laughs> when you look at an ISFP, and not I don't mean the ISFPs who are would be SEIs in sociologics. Mm -hmm. And when I think of it, it's actually it's introverted feeling. What I'd expect is that the extroverted feeling, at least in sociologic terms, would be suppressed. So mm -hmm. I imagine it actually is not expressive. Mm -hmm. They don't have a, hi, how's it going? All that sort of, which ISFJs should mm -hmm. show, because they have creative extroverted feeling. And yeah. ISFP, when I think of an ISFP, I don't think of Winnie okay. the Pooh. I think of <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher. Oh. Iron cool. Lady. Or, okay, other examples. Um, An Aristotelian? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. No, no, you know who? who? The um, C C Catelyn Stark. Oh, 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 wait, hold on. Uh, that's from is that, uh, Hunger Game. Games, right? No, 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 still Game of Thrones. Oh, oh, okay, hold on, I'm trying to remember. The Cat wife of Ned Stark. They get another guy who got his head chopped off in the first season. Oh, the the uh, mother. Shoot, I can't remember. I'm not really. I don't remember. Dang, it's been such a long time. I remember the name though. Yeah, she is the vengeful wife of Ned Stark. She's all Jeff about Joffrey's. Joffrey's uh, mother. No, 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 no. The Starks, not the yeah. Lannister. Joffrey's mother, Cersei. My she be well. I'm not sure she's portrayed in the books. I say mm -hmm. she's she's a an, an SLE. Mm. Okay. She has no introverted ethics whatsoever. She she Got uses it. people as tools. She doesn't. But 
um, actually, you look at the Starks, you've actually got two, both of them actually quite stony faced. Mm -hmm. They don't actually express very much. Right. Out of you, Catelyn is far more fiery, right? When, they're, when, when someone has betrayed her bonds of loyalty, mm -hmm. she will avenge. Yeah. And she does avenge. And that's mm -hmm. when she actually gets killed after she avenges that person. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventually, it's the wife of, um, you know, the, the guy, the, the phrase, Walter mm -hmm. Frey. Ned, was, I think, was an INFP. Also, not expressive, very much relationship driven at the expense of emotions for anyone. Mm -hmm. And But he had extrovert sensation as his blind spot. Mm -hmm. so not read the power relations. He was actually quite naive. And he got, as mm -hmm. we got bumped off so early, he was mm -hmm. not, he was almost too gentle for the world he was in. It was too yeah. idealistic for the world he was in. I have to look back and see how I, because uh, I, I actually remember I did a whole video on that, but then <laughs> I can't recall what I typed. So now I want to, I just also want to compare. Uh, it, because, it's, because it's well, because George R. R. Martin understands character well, mm -hmm. I can type the characters and feel I'm not making sense of, of contradicting elements. Most of the time, I can, if I feel, from looking through the cat, I see a consistent. It's when I when I know it's a good writer, when I know people say this is a good writer, the character driven nature is brilliant. I tend to be able to type the character as well as mm. a sign that he's put real people together rather than sort of composite characters. Right, right. Even I don't focus on the TV shows. Mm. I don't, you get the same sort of problem, right? Um, if you look at oh. Um, Lannister, what's his name? Not, not the one everyone likes. Tyrion Lannister. Yes. Tyrion Lannister. He's made a lot more jolly than he is in the books. They, they sort of alphaized him. They've had an alpha actor play this gamma character. Um, the real, I, I say Tyrion Lannister is actually an ENTJ. I actually agree with that. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I agree with that. But I'm, I'm looking at my thing now. For some reason, I don't have Ned Stark on here i wish i remembered the show a little bit more i do have catelyn or caitlin was there a caitlin i'm i'm so and that is catelyn catelyn okay, caitlin. okay got you yeah i typed her as an istj there we so, go yes <laughs> that is yeah that is an interesting because isfps are not soft they are tough mm. they are the guardians they are the protectors to be a protector you need to understand people you need to form judgments of the character of the people around you and then take action to defend your relationships. That's still mm. very much feeling. It's still ethics. It's not logic. It's personal, it's personal relationship driven, first mm. and foremost. She could be quite vindictive against people she didn't like. She was cruel to Jon Snow because he was the son of he she he she believed he was the son of the, the woman who Ned Stark had an affair with. Ned Stark actually mm. didn't have. He was always loyal because mm. that's what the character. But she felt that's what happened, and so her personal judgment made her cruel to what was actually a nice person. But mm. she was personal relationship and attitude driven first and foremost. Well, it doesn't make sense for her to be a a, a pra particularly pragmatic figure. She mm. wasn't a very pragmatic figure. She was personal relationships driven almost all the way through, personal loyalties. And she could call upon loyalties of other people, loyal to House Stark to help her and serve her. But she wasn't this very pragmatic thinker. Um, she was yeah, actually, that would be a little bit more of TE in Myers Briggs, her ability to yeah. call up. So, yeah. But I, I see, yeah, I see the, the differences. I, I understand your approach. Yeah, but, but yeah, people feel forced to type her a thinker, a TJ, because she's tough and she's organized. Perhaps. I wish I remembered the show a little bit more so I could actually bring up more examples. It's been so long since uh, I've, I've done it. But I think that the thing is, I've seen also ISFPs who are like Mulan, but then also ISFPs who I often mention. Actually, I believe that Daenerys Targaryen was an ISFP and who fit more of what you're talking about where it's like her values were so strong that she fought to get that. But if anything, she didn't seem as pragmatic because if anything, it seemed like she, she was not, she was, it was more like erratic and chaotic in a way. 
And so she was still tough minded. She was still protective, almost in the way that you're explaining Catelyn. Um, but well, I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember Catelyn as much. So I wouldn't say because I, I don't see yeah. ISFPs as aggressive all the time. I do know those types, but yeah. Yeah. What I would say, Daenerys' values don't quite rhyme with Gamma. Mm. They rhyme actually with Beta. If anything... And that's why people type her as an ENFJ. Because... Uh, yeah. Could, yeah. Could be. Could be. Mm -hmm. Look, she makes decisions based on just knowing. She mm. just knew that that fire was going to be her almost her apotheosis moment her moment when suddenly she would rise as queen of the dothraki you know she she's motivated by there's a strong introverted intuition a, a sense of destiny by which she is going to change the world that mm. is a grandiosity behind her that is very beta mm. very very beta and also she grows in her assertiveness over time she starts off quite meek she right. becomes more far more dominant over time it's what you'd expect again from the mm. j sort of figure and she has this ability to manifest her charisma across in this very convincing sort of way i i think she's a beta and f thinking about it yeah and from understanding socionics i would agree with that especially she's not like you right but, he, he, but, I so, do, but i also do know enfjs who can be that way too so i think that's where it's like it would just be like a different, but yeah, it's going back to what you're saying with the consistency and everything. Cause then I'm now I'm thinking of like, uh, the last person, uh, that I was, uh, Oh no. What was her name? Uh, the, I think there was only one ENFJ in the whole show that I was able to identify. Uh, ah, her name, Mark Marjorie, Marjorie Terrell. Yes. Right. Would, so honest, would that be, she's difficult. Are you talking about the books? You're talking about the TV series. TV series. <laughs> TV series, right? What is she? Okay. She is someone who's actually quite pragmatic. She's not very strategic. She's very charming and the personal one to one. She's using both extroverted feeling and introverted feeling sort of in the mix. Mm. Um, she, yeah, she, she, she's sort of, you could say she's probably ESFP like, I would say. Though in the books, She's mm -hmm. very different. She's actually more INFJ-like. So it's, it's, it's she's not, again, she's another sort of composite character. Mm -hmm. I, think. Um, okay. I, st I stay away from TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, it, so it, yeah, exactly. So you what you saw from her was her blend of extroverted feeling and introverted feeling, mm -hmm. which it's not this thing. Extroverted feeling should be uncompromising if it's in a leading function. It should repress and suppress introverted feeling. If mm. it's not, according to Jung, it wouldn't be extroverted feeling in the dominant function. Mm. Um, also, I'd say, it, I think the way P and J works in terms of how it's tested, realistically, how people te start telling each other they're ENFJ or ENFP, they've probably taken the test. And the test hasn't done cognitive functions most of the time. It's right. usually done JP, and that's basically conscientiousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the question is, is it a more um, salient difference between ENFP and ENFJ that one is motivated to change the world and rise in influence and um, their ability to inspire and motivate um, people through their image versus someone who's about their personal growth and development and being able to unlock the potential of others as well through their personal growth and that accumulation of skills. Is that difference in values more salient than an ENF who's more conscientious and an ENF who's less conscientious? Right. And just, you know, of course, to be clear, you know, that, that with, at least from my school of thought, it's definitely not that simple between just conscientious yeah. and I know, sure conscientious ENFPs, but then it's like very clear that FI is there and everything, whereas like ENFJ. So, but yeah, it's, sure. yeah, this is, this has been very interesting because once again, I'm seeing where we intersect and then also where we define differently. And I think that would be 
that would be the first step. <laughs> I mean, I think that we we pretty much have taken the first step in this discussion. And of course, you know, for everyone watching, definitely I'm gonna have Jack um, shout out his uh, his channel. I'm gonna also have all of his details and everything. If you wanna uh, register for his course and everything, I'm gonna have all of that in the description. So be sure to check that out. I'm gonna have Jack give that those details in a moment. But yeah, I guess like this, I have a lot of post processing to do mm -hmm. with everything that's been said here. But I'm really grateful that you were open to having this conversation um, and for sharing your thoughts and also listening, especially so that I can better be able to understand and present my school of thought and everything because yeah this has been very helpful for me and what i'm really seeing is how it all really does come back down to like how you said like everything can be explained in each model and also your uh what you're saying about like you know what's realistic but then you know i like i said i've been coaching it's like oh this seems realistic still because i'm using it in real life but then we also intersect at certain points, like with Tyrion, where it's like, I know a lot of Myers-Briggs people who would say, oh, Tyrion is ENTP. And it's like, yeah. no, but he's using T E N I. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, so it's, it's yeah, like, I, I, I think that that's what makes it uh, different, which then goes back to what you were also saying, where like, if we move to socionics, then we would just all have a very consistent view, whereas like MBTI, MBTI people are even still disagreeing on Tyrion Lannister, for example. And so... That I see what you're saying. There. It's another example where when he says things straight from the book, he's a gamma. Mm -hmm. When he's at, when he just do, does things which aren't connected to the book, he becomes an alpha, and mm -hmm. so he looks exactly like an ENTP. But yeah, exactly. Somehow, like, the, the way he treats relationships doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Why is he so torn apart by, about this be particular betrayal? Why does he kill her in, ven in, in vengeance when he realizes he's been betrayed? It's such an ENTJ response. It's the introverted feeling being damaged, not introverted sensation. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, Denzel, thank you so much for your openness, your graciousness, your inquiring mind, and your relentless push to make things practical and useful to help other people. For sure. I, yeah, this has been an honor. Um, and can you tell us, anyone, where they can find you, a little bit about your course, all of that? And like I said, I'll have all of that in the description just for people who might be listening. Okay, so my channel, World Socionics Society, S-O-C-I-O-N-I-C-S, because people sometimes say it's um, socionomics, it's socionics. Yeah. Um, yes, and if you'd like to email me to get in touch, if you want to join my course, it's, it's late to join it as a participator, but for a reduced fee, of, of 100, so it's only 180 pounds. You can watch all the recordings that are being made of this pilot of the course. Um, yeah, feel free to get in touch on worldsocionics at hotmail.com. And I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, how the, the future develops, how these different ideas will intermingle and change over time. For sure. And I'll definitely also have Jack's Twitter. He's active on there. Oh, um, yes, I am active on Twitter as well. Yeah. Yeah, so y'all can definitely contact him. But thanks again, Jack, for this conversation. Um, and we're definitely going to have you on this channel again soon, especially as I continue to learn a little bit more and bring up some more thoughts. And maybe even one day we can discuss the differences and similarities yeah. through. I know that you said that you're not really big on like the character, uh, like like typing characters and everything. So you could probably do a mix. I, I like it. Look. For me, if it's fictional, it needs to be well written and consistent. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point? We're dealing with something which is like we, we're looking. We're trying to measure a chimera's wings. Exactly. But yeah. If we are talking about real fictional people, right. <laughs> they have to be real by the nature of them being real. So we yeah. have need to. We have stuff to do. And also, one thing I'm doing is actually te teaching people how to type famous mm -hmm. people, historical figures, from using whatever information we can gather mm -hmm. uh, to put together a picture of someone. So, yeah. yeah, the more public figures we have, the better we can create a shared benchmark of understanding. I fully agree with that. Yeah. And I think that's that's definitely something I want to come back and talk to you about. I'm actually going to watch Breaking Bad <laughs> so that we can yeah. discuss that and maybe even some of the surrounding characters. And yeah, we're just going to definitely have a part two. But thanks, everyone, for watching. Make sure to leave comments, questions, whatever you have in mind. Um, check out Jack and done.
Thank you for taking time to watch that video. If you watched it, whether it be on regular speed or two times speed, I appreciate it. And if you don't mind hitting that like button for me, it really helps this humble channel out. Also, if you haven't already subscribed and you like the content that I make, then be sure to subscribe and hit that bell button. That way you'll be able to keep in touch with all the new posts that I make. And then also be sure to check out my playlist where you'll be able to find a lot of my older videos because I think that a lot of those have some great quality content too. But anyway, thanks again for watching. Make sure to leave comments, questions, book me for coaching sessions at denzelmensa.com and God bless.